Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. In one of our last episodes, we looked at the future colonization of the moon through the lens of science fiction. We discovered some interesting patterns, like the utilization of the moon's helium-3 as a fuel source for nuclear fusion, habitats that were mainly burrowed underground to protect the humans from radiation, and of course, unchecked corporate greed contributing to some unethical treatment of the workers, and of course, the continuation of old Earth rivalries and arms races. Today we'll be moving on to the next planet in our solar system, Mars. The red planet is seen by some as the future for humanity and the next stepping stone to our conquest of the galaxy. Whereas most people view the moon as a barren place that is full of cheese and Nazis, humanity has always viewed Mars as the next planet we would colonize, as depicted in the award-winning based on true story cinematic masterpiece, Doom. But aside from that and Elon Musk's over-enthusiastic enthusiasm about colonization, what exactly does Mars have in store for us? How will the colonization of Mars look like according to the great scientific and artistic minds who bring us on their imaginative, imaginary science fiction journey? The Martian is a cautionary tale about massive expenditure waste directed to save Matt Damon because he missed the space bus home and has an oversized ego concerning his own importance. We did an entire video about how much Matt Damon has cost the world. Let's just say we could have saved a lot of kids with cancer with the amount of money the world has spent on trying to save him in various films. But what is admittedly very interesting about this movie is how it depicts the harshness of Martian survival, especially without any backup. This is not some prepared world that we can just waltz onto and immediately inhabit. Humanity will need to go to great lengths to create a sustainable outpost on the Red Planet. For one, the Ares 3 missions using the Hermes vessel takes roughly four months to traverse the massive distances between the two planets. This all occurs in 2035 with propulsion systems that are beyond our own current technology, but not significantly so. This extreme distance means that the Mars missions, unlike the Moon missions, will need to be able to sustain life for an extended period of time without any backup or supply missions. And so when Matt Damon misses his ride home because he's kind of a pussy and can't handle a dust storm in a really thin atmosphere at a third of Earth's gravity, the rescue mission that will be sent to get him will take more than a year to reach him. And so Matt Damon is trapped on a planet without a significant global magnetosphere to protect him from solar radiation and an atmosphere that is extremely thin and cannot sustain life. Luckily, Matt Damon is a botanist and able to use Martian soil fertilized with bio waste to grow potato. He also uses the oxygenator and some rocket fuel to generate water. And fortunately for us, from what we can tell, Matt Damon's limited habitat and perilous journey across the Martian surface most likely did expose him to massive amounts of radiation, which hopefully will have damaged him at a genetic level. Of course, we have to talk about the expanse when talking about Mars, because Mars is not only colonized in this TV series, it becomes a full-fledged faction that even rivals the power of the UN-controlled Earth. So how exactly did Mars become such a powerful player? While we aren't given an exact timeline for the colonization of Mars, what we do know is within three generations of Martians living on Mars, they basically start to grow restless and want to have independence from Earth. Although still dependent on Earth for certain supplies, the goal of self-sustainability was becoming closer and closer to a possibility. Mars, of course, is a harsh place when compared to Earth, as established by Matt Damon. But when humans are pushed to an extreme and have the right mindset and good leadership, we can achieve amazing things. And it's had humanity first. If we look at the UAE, cities like Abu Dhabi and Dubai are located in extremely harsh and hot deserts, which really lack any significant fresh water sources. They've been able to exist because of new technologies like desalination and extremely efficient and fast transportation of foods and other essential supplies. Another example would be Israel, a small nation surrounded by hostile and unstable states, which make trade relations with those states a liability. And so Israel has led the world in agricultural technology and turned arid biomes into thriving farmland. Mars is no different in that matter. There is a harshness to the land that unifies and focuses the people. And so they don't focus on silly things like stuff we see in our own news cycle. But after all, America is a land of prosperity and there's plenty of natural resources and land. So we have stagnated a little bit because of our luxuries. 
Real challenges require real solutions. And so on Mars, the talented and skilled don't just become financial advisors or lawyers. Instead, they focus on result-driven professions like becoming engineers or scientists. The Martians are scientific and pragmatic people who perhaps lack the empathy that more comfortable nations can afford to have. On top of that, Mars attracts a certain type of individual that we have seen come up in human history time and time again. The early Martian settler is not all that different from the Jews who escaped from Central Europe as it slipped into fascism pre-World War II, or the Protestants who escaped religious persecution and wound up on the shores of colonial America. These are individuals who have taken a huge risk in order to escape whatever persecution or economic issues they face back at home to look for a new horizon and a new hope. Earth in the expanse has stagnated. Worse yet, overpopulation has led to massive government intervention at almost every level of society. The state takes care of all, which unfortunately also means there's no longer a vibrant free market or even enough jobs for the average human. People who want to work and get educated wait their entire lives for a placement in the job lottery. Mars all of a sudden becomes an extremely enticing place for those who are willing to work and hope for a better future. And so soon, the Martians became self-sustainable and they publish a manifesto. It's not all that different from the American Declaration of Independence Against Vampires and the Martian Congressional Republic is established. Not surprisingly, the UN sees the Martians as a breakaway province and they send 40 warships to get their rebellious colonists under control. Thankfully, like during the Cuban Missile Crisis, cooler heads prevail. And the UN heads home and Mars is free to grow and prosper. But Earth is not comfortable with the fact that Mars continues to grow at an outrageous rate. Their scientific research, for instance, quickly outpaces Earth. At first, the focus is on terraforming, agriculture, and making the red planet like Earth. There is a collective dream the Martians share that one day they will no longer have to walk around Mars with a pressurized suit and live in cities without domes overhead. But then Mars inevitably builds their own shipyard and military infrastructure and no longer needs Earth or Luna to develop ships for their merchants and defense force. Soon, the Martian Congressional Navy surpasses Earth in technology, if not size. The Martians begin calling the Earthlings blues, and the Earthlings begin calling the Martians reds. Although older generations remember time when all humans were the same color, just different shades, the newer generations have developed completely independent identities, and we have once again split apart as a species. Without an external threat to challenge all of us, Earth and Mars once again face each other and prepare for war. In the original Total Recall, instead of the Martians creating their own governments, corporate entities in the vacuum of government oversight and regulation have turned the planet into their own personal fiefdom. Due to a lack of safety standards, the first domes built on Mars were cheaply made and exposed its inhabitants to the Martian atmosphere and radiation causing high incidence of mutations and disfigurements, and some of these mutants even gained psychic powers. The leader of the Martian colony and its security forces is Velos Cohagen. He starts a relentless campaign to repress and secretly eliminate these Martian colonists. You can't really blame him because he wants to make Mars a beautiful tourist trap for Earthlings, but the mutants are really scaring all the nice families and all their money. So once again, the large distance between Mars and Earth has allowed Mars to basically establish its own rule, independent from any oversight from Earth. In Ad Astra, U.S. Spacecom has a small and secretive military base on Mars. It is relatively sparse when compared to the large and luxurious lunar city and military base we talked about in our last video. They also seem to have a temperature check station and people wearing N95s at the arrival area. Clearly, they are concerned of contaminants and pathogens on Mars. So until we truly terraform the red planet or establish a large enough colony like the one in Expanse, the distance between Earth and Mars, roughly 33.9 million miles at its closest approach, is going to be a huge obstacle for us to overcome. Even if we do figure out how to create the Epstein Drive, which totally didn't kill itself, or nuclear fusion, there still would need to be a turn and burn at one point to decelerate the ship at safe rates so that the crew doesn't Epstein themselves. Of course, one day we can create some kind of space magic like we see in Star Wars where they have these things called inertial compensators, which kind of generates an artificial gravity bubble around the passengers so they don't feel the effects of acceleration and deceleration. But who knows? Oh, by the way, in Ad Astra, it takes only around 20 days for Brad Pitt to go from the moon to Mars, which is relatively quick by today's standards. 
And as our hero journeys through the Martian space com, there is also a sense of brooding emptiness and loneliness hanging over the entire place. Although we see Mars as a potential new home for humanity, the actual fulfillment of this dream will be a lot harder than even Elon Musk realizes. In the space between us, a mission to Mars is interrupted when one of the astronauts realizes that she is pregnant when en route to the Martian colony. To make matters worse, the astronaut in question had relations with the CEO of the corporation that is funding this entire mission. Talk about insider training. That actually doesn't make sense. Anyway, so a young boy named Gardner is the first human to ever be born on the Red Planet. While the colony does have access to clean water, food, oxygen, and shelter from radiation, there is no real way to generate the 1G our bodies have evolved on on the surface of Mars. Mars has about 33% the gravity of Earth, which creates a lot of problems. This means that if you weigh 200 pounds on Earth, you'll feel more like 70 pounds on Mars. This means that Gardner's muscles and bone density will probably be severely underdeveloped when compared to an Earthling's, and even his organs, like his heart, won't be able to handle the stress of just basic things on Earth, which is why when he travels to Earth for the first time, the struggle is real. This is actually what we see happen in the Expanse with the Belters. Now, the Martians are better suited in the Expanse for Earth-like gravity, especially Martian Marines because they often train in 1G in preparation for combat on Earth, and there are also various medicines and injections that increase bone density and heart strength. As of now, there are a lot of theories about whether it is even possible to give birth on Mars and what a human on Mars will look like and whether they will be able to return back to Earth. But most likely, they will have a lot of problems unless they go through some serious medical procedures. So for the last few hundred years, uh, Mars has been kind of a staple in science fiction when it comes to humanity's new home in the stars. Of course, it's also been a place where we've speculated that aliens come from. Now, in modern times, we've realized that Mars is not exactly the easiest place to settle in. It's a very harsh environment, and it's going to take a lot of resources, a lot of willpower and ingenuity, which humanity has a lot of. And so hopefully, you know, Elon Musk eventually reaches his goal. I am rooting for him. It'd be nice to have two planets in the solar system instead of one. Anyway, guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. Maybe we'll do another video where we cover, I don't know, Jupiter and Saturn's moons because there are a lot of interesting sci-fi films about those places and how humanity can ultimately colonize them. All right, guys, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.